This episode lives in the Dylan FM archives, and what you're about to hear is a 15-minute teaser edition. To hear the full show and every complete show in our archives, become an FM Plus subscriber. You can sign up in the Apple Podcast app or at fmpods.com. Get more details in the show notes. As a subscriber, you'll get access to over 400 episodes from this and other shows in the FM Pods network. And you'll be helping to make these shows possible. This is Dylan FM, the podcast that goes deep into the work and world of Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place with your host, Craig Danuloff. But I mean, certainly it was apparent from the first time one heard the album that it was a return to form. It was the best thing he'd done for years. It was completely in the pocket, as they say. Howard Soons is the author of Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. It's a comprehensive biography written by a former journalist based on over 250 interviews with names like Al Cooper, T-Bone Burnett, Nora Guthrie, and many more. And unlike other Dylan biographies, it's up to date, having been revised in 2021, so it covers even the release of Rough and Rowdy Ways. Before we dig into the recording of Time Out of Mind, I wanted to spend some more time looking at those years before the album was recorded. Howard's book does a great job of describing Dylan in the early 90s, with insights from many people who were there, and I thought that speaking with him would be a great way to get a sense of where Bob was in his career and in the period leading up to the recording of Time Out of Mind. Howard has written well-reviewed books on Lou Reed, Paul McCartney, Charles Bukowski, and others. And as you'll hear, he's a knowledgeable and lifelong Dylan fan and a thoughtful observer of his life and work. In our conversation, we talk about the process of writing a big biography, drill down on where Bob was in his life in the early 90s, and then we discuss Time Out of Mind and the reception it received. Howard also shares stories about some of the amazing people he spoke with, including Suze Rotolo, Sally Grossman, Echo Hellstrom, William Zantzinger, and more. Check the show notes or our website for a link to get a copy of his book in print or on Kindle. It's called Down the Highway, The Life of Bob Dylan. A great place to start would be how you came to take on this project. Were you a Dylan fan? Did you see the opportunity in the market? What what brought you to do such a big project and spend so much time on, on Dylan? Well, I just started my life as a full-time writer. I'd written one book, which was a bestseller, and I needed a new book. And I wanted to write a biography. And I had lunch with a publisher. And we both were Bob Dylan fans, actually. And I had been since I was a teenager and had seen the shows and read all the books, and I was just a fan. And my publisher my, my publisher friend was a fan, and he said, oh, well, Bob Dylan's going to be 60 in two years' time. And I kind of said, oh, I didn't know that. I hadn't realized that. And he said, well, that's an opportunity to write a book. And I, that's when the light bulb went off, and I thought, oh, I didn't realize that Bob being 60 would be such a big deal in terms of a marketing opportunity for a book. And he said, yeah, so that's going to be a big opportunity if you want to do it. And then I and then I went off and got a, uh, you know, a commission, um, a contract to write this book. And so, you know, it was done out of a genuine existing love and interest in Bob Dylan's music, which went back to when I was about 15, 14. And I first saw him live when I was about that age, actually. But um it was then a business opportunity, um, but having had the opportunity, I, I grasped it. You know, I really went for it in a big way, and I spent two years on it. I spent a lot of time and money, really investigating him as a man, because biography is the story of a life. You know, biography is different to writing about music. Biography is the story of a man's or a woman's life, and it has to have a kind of narrative arc, and it's about the personal life and the work and everything, the personality. And uh, and I used to be a newspaper journalist. That's my background. So I was, I was trained to find stuff out and investigate people. And, as, and essentially, that's what I did. I investigated Bob Dylan for two years. So the idea of that approach, and especially as, as we'll talk about, uh, one of the notable things about this book is the 
you know, the original number is 250 interviews and the, the, the name list is unbelievable. So you knew you were going to do that approach because as a journalist, that was your background. Was taking that approach to Dylan particularly difficult, which I guess means does, you know, is the veil of secrecy they're all sworn to real? And did you encounter it? Well, here's the surprising thing. There was an onus on me to do a really good job because, to be frank, I was paid a lot of money to do this book. So I had I had money, I had time, had a good publisher, but they really wanted a you know they wanted something substantial, and one way of kind of showing off is to say, oh, I've interviewed two hundred people. So there's a little bit of that, you know, there's a bit of marketing in that. But having said that, I really did set out to try and speak to everyone I could. You know, I wouldn't take no for an answer. I, you know, I went after people. I went to their, where they lived. I went after them uh, in a really, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say an aggressive way, but a really determined way. And um, the surprising thing is that actually it was quite easy because Bob Dylan comes from a kind of bohemian background, intellectual bohemian friends who are, you know, independent thinkers. They don't like being told what to do. And if you go to see, let's say, Dave Van Ronk or Suze Rotolo or someone like that and say, look, do you want to do an interview for a book? They, they will decide on their, on their own whether they want to do it or not. They won't, they won't, their first reaction won't be, oh, what does Bob think? Because they're not, they're not that sort of people. They're kind of freewheeling people, to use a, a cliche. And indeed, in the, in the few times when they did try to ask Bob, they couldn't get hold of him. Because he's so remote, <laughs> he's so remote. They didn't. They just couldn't get hold of him, you know. And 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 the real the real test of this was when I, I guess I, I interviewed some of his family, and uh, I got the impression that a he knew about it right from the start. Well, he did because I wrote to him right at the start, but he didn't give a shit. He just didn't give a shit, which was very re very refreshing and very very uh, enabling for the biographer. And I've had the opposite experience with big stars when they're very controlling and they try and make your life really difficult and they can, but Bob just, he knew about it from the start. He didn't give a shit. And as a result, oh, a, lot great. People, a lot of people spoke to me. And of course, the other thing is when I did this book 20 years ago, a lot of people were alive who are not, not around now. Yeah, no, I noted that as I went, th as I went through the list and there's, there's a couple of them that later I might want to ask you about specific people that it, uh, I don't know anyone that talked to, and it'd be interesting to hear something else about those conversations. But the beginning of your book, I found interesting in that you start at the 30th anniversary celebration and with a really interesting story that clearly came from inside information about Bob's experience with that. Can, can you maybe just tell us a little bit about that as the setup, and then we'll talk forward and backwards relative to time out of mind. I needed a, an introduction to the book. I needed a, a scene. Uh, in terms of constructing a, a story. So I didn't want to open in 1941 in Minnesota. I wanted, to, or even before that, I wanted to open now, as it were, Bob Dylan now, as a famous, important, revered person. And so I needed a kind of a scene, something that he had done in recent years. And I, of all the people I spoke to, one of the things that just kind of lent itself to that as a device, as a prologue, essentially, to a book, was this anniversary concert at Madison Square Garden. And in particular, an interview I did with a guy called, whom you, you and fans would have heard of, called Tommy Makin, who was one of those Irish folk singers from Greenwich Village from Bob's very early years in New York, one of the, those guys that he met when he was just a young guy making his name. And by 1992, Tommy Makin was running a bar in Manhattan, a kind of a pub, I suppose, Irish pub, and Bob Dylan, and he told me this story about how Bob Dylan came in one night, just came in on his own. They hadn't seen each other for years. And make him uh, was quite interesting in his observation about Bob being a kind of lonely, isolated, middle-aged man, very famous, but no one with him, and a bit melancholy, perhaps. You know, that's how make him read him. And then this tied into the concert because then Bob had the, this huge concert, Madison Square Garden, televised event, George Harrison, Eric Clapton, all these sort of superstar people. And then he had the after show party at Tommy Makin's bar. And so in terms of a writer writing a book, it was just a nice kind of, it made, it made two and a half thousand words 
I could encapsulate lots of ideas in it. And then I and I could then look back, you know, I could I could then say to the reader, well, how did Bob Dylan get to this stage in life? Where was he in 93? And, and what did you learn about the 10 years or so that brought him there? Well, I, I suppose if you wanted to reduce it down to a soundbite, you could say he was having a kind of midlife crisis. He was in his, what, late 50s then? By this stage or mid 50s no early 50s but he seemed older he'd lived a, he had a long career already uh and he and in the 10 years previously well at the time for instance i really hated the gospel stuff when i was a teenager an atheist i was just horrified that my hero was, became a born-again christian i thought he'd gone mad you know i just was horrified now I'm now an older person. I now see actually those were really terrific records. But then they had, we had all those terrible, from infidels onwards, it was just a sort of um, a sad decline, really, where he clearly just wasn't, he just didn't feel comfortable or, or he lost his, his way. He lost his path in life. I think personally and professionally, he didn't really give a shit. Uh, he was bored, perhaps. He didn't quite know what he was doing or what he wanted to do. I mean, of course, there are exceptions. I mean, there's Oh Mercy and um, things like that. But, I mean, when you look back on Empire Burlesque and Knocked Out Loaded and Down in the Groove, they're such disappointing records. I think in every case, there's at least one track on it that's interesting. I mean, he's he's always interesting, whatever he does. Uh, even if he sang the phone book, you know, he'd be interesting. But... Um, it was a kind of, you know, a sort of a, a, there was obviously a great artist here, a great figure in the arts who was going through a, a fallow period up to, I suppose, those two, those two cover albums, you know, um, especially World Gone Wrong, which seemed to be a turning point, really. So then he goes and creates World Gone Wrong and kind of has that period of going to ground a little bit with the folk songs. Let's move into the time out of mind period. What, what, where do you, where did that begin? Meaning there hadn't been, you know, there's seven years between, between an original Bob Dylan song. I couldn't find 18 months before that when there was ever a gap between an original Bob Dylan song, right? These songs start to uh, be written. I think you have a couple stories about, I think him with uh, Ronnie Wood in Ireland somewhere. And then um, they eventually are shown to uh, 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 Lenoir. What, what do you remember or what comes to mind in terms of the emergence of, of the time out of mind material i don't remember a lot to be honest because it's 20 years since i wrote the book and i that sort of detail is is become foggy yeah. one of one of the sort of memories or impressions i had was that i know that up to around 1990 which i think was red sky and the wilburys album yeah. a member of his family actually said to me that he was he was feeling he was being spread too thin he didn't like doing the wilburys album the second one, anyway, he kind of went along with it, and he was kind of juggling. He had he had a tour, he had tours booked. He had his own album. He had the Wilburys album, and he was pretty fed up. He was trying to do too much, and maybe that's a part of the explanation for why that album was so poor and why he then took a long break. And then one of his girlfriends was quite a good interview in the book. She says that there was this point around this time when he decided to, to rebuild his, his career, rebuild his stage show, certainly, from the ground up. And Victor used to speak about that, that they, they started playing smaller places and, you know, they're kind of work, changing the act and kind of work, sort of starting from the ground up, as it were, trying to get back to the root of what he was about. And I, and I think that was a long, slow process. So yeah, the Neverending Tour started in 88 and, and that kind of relentless back roads touring process. Thanks for listening to this part of this episode. We hope you'll consider becoming an FM Plus subscriber to hear the full version of this and all of our shows. Sign up in the Apple Podcasts app or at fmpods.com.